So the story of the Yellowstone, in the late 1930s, the American government went to three railroads and said, you know, um, this situation in Europe, it wasn't solved by World War I. Uh, we're going to be back there. And it's going to be quicker than you know. And we're going to have to settle the European problem because that's what it's going to take. There, are th And we're going to be back at it. But it's going to be bigger, much bigger. And we're going to be in it right from the beginning with the Lend-Lease program. There are three railroads that cannot sustain a war effort in Europe in their current capacity. One of them was the Union Pacific at the Tehachapi Pass. It was already maxed out for volume and they had to get all those fruits and vegetables and food stuff from the West Coast um, out to the East Coast so they could be shipped to Europe. The other railroad they went to was the Duluth Masabi and Iron Range and they said, you know, this one's going to take a lot of armament and a lot of steel. And you guys are running 60 car trains, already double tracked. And you're going to need to haul 160 car trains. They went to Erie Lackawanna and said, you know what it's going to take to make iron ore into steel is coal for coke. And you guys are running 30, 40, 50 car trains. And you're going to need to run 160 car trains of coal. So you guys are going to have to get these bigger engines. And so, um, interestingly enough, they bought them from Baldwin. And there's an interesting story there. The number 27 was built in 1941 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Eddystone. It's a 2884. And it was built for one thing and one thing only, hauling iron ore for World War II. What is interesting is they were all bought by the, or was all built by the Baldwin Company. And at the time, Baldwin was owned by, you know, the expression when the auto when the auto industry tanked in America a couple of years ago, they said about General Motors and Chrysler too big to fail, so the government took them over for a time. Well, guess what else was too big to fail during the Depression years of the 1920s and 30s? Ah, Baldwin Locomotive Works. So who took it over? The United States government which had now contracts to build big engines for Union Pacific, DM&IR, and Erie Lackawanna, thereby bailing out uh, the Baldwin Locomotive Works. War has a great economic impact one should never forget. And maybe that's one of the saddest points about war is that it has an economic impact that may be the only halfway beneficial thing about war is that it has that. It's a sad, sad one indeed, but it did in this particular case. So it ran, the Yellowstone did one job and one job only, and that was hauling iron ore from the mines on Masabi and Vermilion Ranges to the docks in Duluth and Two Harbors. And um, they bought uh, 18 of these locomotives over the war years uh, and uh, preserved them, uh, mainly as a testament to uh, the contributions of the DM&IR, mainly the competitions are the contributions of the miners and the mining industry in northeastern Minnesota. Um, had there not been two world wars, we'd still be digging natural ore instead of taconite. Uh, the taconite will last for another 100 years, but uh, we could still be mining natural ore had not uh, World War I and World War II uh, used so much of it. I tell people when I give tours today, uh, a good deal of northern Minnesota lies on the bottom of the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean and is strewn across Europe. And um, that's that's the case. She operated for 19 years. That was what I was going to say. Um, the thing that makes the, the Mali so incredible is that it was one of the last group that was built. So it was the 1941 group. Um, so it was one of the later ones. Had only a 19-year running life. And uh, of all of them, at the end of uh, its lifetime, had the best boiler, still had the best boiler. Um, and what Don Shank did, remember, first part of the collection was that Mallee. That was the first thing with the word save painted on it and stored in the round of the Mallee house up in Proctor. 
Um, so what they did was they ran it on its last day, drained it, winterized it, parked it in a heated Mallee building. And there it sat until there was a museum one day that up until that point only existed in the imagination of Don Shank. But he always said, someday there'll be a railroad museum in Duluth, Minnesota. He had uh, good forward thinking um, ideas. Yep. It's an extremely powerful locomotive. 6,000 horsepower, uh, 12 tons of coal an hour, 12,000 gallons of water into steam every hour. It's interesting, the big boy is slightly larger, uh, but the Yellowstone is more powerful. The Yellowstone has smaller drivers. It was built for power, not speed. Um, it was also, the big boy is a compound steam engine, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, the steam was used twice, uh, first time in a high pressure cylinder, and then instead of being exhausted to the atmosphere, was reused in a low pressure cylinder. So you could get more mileage out of the water and the coal, or in the case of the Yellowstone, now oil, but you could get more mileage out of it. This thing only needed to go 75, 85 miles uh, from the iron range to the docks. So what was more important was it, the economy of coal and water was not as important as those 160 ore cars. And so you could fuel and water the engine at either end of its run. And that's all you had to do. You didn't need to go 200, 250 miles before there was water. You, you didn't have the Union Pacific uh, track trackage to cover. You had the trackage from Duluth Two Harbors up to the Iron Range. So the engine was literally built for the railroad and not just necessarily, I mean, it was built exactly for what it was used. And that kind of makes its story a little unique as well. Uh, when did the 227 last operate? June of 1960 was her last ore run. And that was late when you think about the conversion to diesel locomotives. Um, the DM&IR had mostly dieselized by this time, but they had this investment in these huge Yellowstones, and I think they wanted to get their money's worth out of them. I noticed with uh, watching the videos on YouTube that uh, the wheels and the connecting rods move. That's one of the things we're known for. Uh, the engine is actually jacked up uh, about a half an inch off the rails, and um, the pistons itself has been removed. So when you see the wheels and the connecting uh, rods uh, moving, uh, the piston has been removed from the cylinder. Uh, so the, the piston rod is just going back and forth. Um, but what's interesting is those two sets of wheels are so finely built and so wonderfully engineered that it only takes a quarter horse electric motor to move them. And of course, it's, it's torqued up quite a bit to get them started. But once they're running, only a quarter horsepower of power is necessary because they're so finely balanced and tuned. And they did that all without a CAD machine or a computer, uh, just on drawings and on a slide rule.